Today's presenter, Russell Jackman, is a graduate of the McGeorge School of Law, University of Pacific, and was admitted to the State Bar of California in June of 1994. He has been vice chair of the California State Bar's Law Practice Management and Technology Committee and a member since 1996. He works specifically with law offices and attorneys that need to get the most out of their legal technology and creates PowerPoint presentations for opening statements, direct examinations, and closing statements to be used in court and can work with attorneys directly to filter their documents and images so that they have the most powerful visual presentations possible. He also works with law offices and solo attorneys to upgrade their older systems to new ones, troubleshooting existing setups and training attorneys and staff on Microsoft programs. He is available for remote access consulting on technology related issues. So please feel free to contact him at any time. Hello, my name is Russell Jackman. And today our topic is technology and bias, spreading it and stopping it. Because as you're going to understand through this uh, uh, talk, that it's very apparent that technology obviously is a tool that is an extension of what human beings use it for. And so it can do both spread bias and the natural biases of human beings. It also is a tool that can be used to stop the bias that is inherent in human beings. And it really depends on how you use it. I know that's a, a cliched way to start off a talk such as this, but when you really get down to it, and if you wanna see a common thread that I'm gonna keep going back to over and over again through this talk, it is that, that the ways that technology can be used to stop bias also allow it to have the ability to spread bias very easily. And so we're always going to be chasing those two things throughout this talk. And, and what makes this talk maybe a little bit more philosophical is that because bias is something that's been so inherent in what how human beings do things, it's sometimes hard to give a straight solution and say this is the answer because if there was then you know everyone would be doing it it would be too easy it's not easy and so this is more to raise awareness and what attorneys and technology can do to help stop bias um, when they see that uh bias is spreading in in a lot of circumstances so let's first start off with a definition of what bias is. And uh, bias is uh, known as an unfair act or policy stemming from prejudice. And bias against certain traits, such as race, religion, sex, handicaps, or disabilities is prohibited in certain areas, such as employment and public services. And they also pointed out in, in deciding legal disputes, a judge is duty bound to render an unbiased opinion based upon a fair and impartial application of the laws of the case, which, you know, obviously I know some of you read that and, and either chuckle or, or, or bang your hand on the keyboard and say, no, that's not the case. And it's not the case. It's, it's, it's supposed to be that way. These are, this is a definition of bias, but it isn't, it isn't what happens in many circumstances because of the way human beings are the way they are. And, and that's the in California, um, where I practice, um, we have statutes based on the elimination of bias. And we want to have that as a, a goal, as part of your MCLE um, requirements. Um, and so uh, uh, this is one way that we can, as a a group and the people that are listening to this talk start to understand that that this is something that that is looked to as a I, I would say sort of a a, a goal um, a an aspiration for 
for different members, for all the members, but it's not so easy to achieve that objective. And so California does recognize the fact that implicit biases exist in all of us. And the legal industry is not very diverse. And it, even myself, I mean, I have to admit it, there's nothing that, that I can do to hide it is that I, I'm a white male and it's, you know, I'm, I'm well represented within the legal industry as opposed to uh, uh, people who are uh, minorities and um, uh, people who are, and, and also women too. It's, it's gotten better over some of the years, but as you can see, some of the numbers that I show, um, especially in a lot of the uh, engineering and mechanical uh, uh, engineering fields and, and science fields, it's uh, very uh, underrepresented with women. And some of the numbers are even dropping. Um, so the goal of the requirement that, that, that about bias um, is to get California attorneys to recognize and fight against um, their own internal biases that contribute towards discrimination in the legal industry, um, as well as biases that present them from adequately serving all populations as their client. So they're trying to, to, to motivate us to, as attorneys to fight for these rights and to be able to recognize it and to know that there's a way that we have the power as attorneys to stop it and to 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 recognize when we see it it's but it takes something you know an internal recognition of those biases when you can understand what they are to you to be able to 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 take action on them. um but as we've notified before as we've said before sex color race religion ancestry national origin physical disabilities which are often big and age um, is a, a really huge part of uh, uh, what's been going on with technology and bias and we will get into that a little later and sexual orientation is areas of focus for courses um, are trying to you know give that sort of uh, uh, perspective and, and either if you take it which this one is is not really focused on any one particular race or color or religion or physical disability or age or whatever. This is more of a, an umbrella type course, more of a philosophical course, but certainly there are focus courses that can be looked at to, um, uh, you know, focus on, on specifically treatment of Hispanics or African Americans or people with disabilities or people with age. And I do urge um, the folks who are uh, uh, listening to this lecture to further find out more about the, uh, 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 the elimination of bias by looking at some of those specialized courses that just go and talk about these other things, because um, this particular course won't be able to talk about every specific element of it. For, for everything, we're again trying to focus on technology. Um, there are a lot of biases and um, uh, many forms of discrimination that attorneys need to be mindful of and fight against in their daily practice. So reviewing them and techniques to stop them is an important component of the MCLE requirement. So as we see here, you know, there is a, uh, a it's mindfulness is probably the biggest part of it. Um, and when we're talking about technology, the mind, the t technology can't do anything more or less than what the person programs it to be. And then, well, it can, it, I mean, less it can be, more it's hard to get, you know, and so when we're delving into the area of what, what is known as artificial intelligence and, and, and we're, we've gotten to a point where, where we've accepted artificial intelligence on so many different levels every day. I mean, from 
when you use your uh, bank card, you, you deposit checks in the ATM and it scans your checks and scans your signature and um, recognizes the handwriting and figures out um, what the monetary amount of the check is. That's artificial intelligence right there. That's, that's optical character recognition, which people have been familiar with for, you know, uh, uh, decades. It's not, not that new. And then, of course, we have, you know, everyone's lovely favorite voicemail, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, stuff that they use for their phone and customer service and, and so forth. So it's, it, it, we're used to interacting with artificial intelligence. We haven't really looked, I don't think the average person really thinks much to how artificial intelligence can create a bias and how technology itself creates certain biases, a lot of which are based on the bias of the person who is the programmer and the industry in which it was created. So probably the, the the biggest issue about recognizing bias is understanding that we have two basic types of biases, and that is conscious bias versus unconscious bias. And conscious bias, I would, again, is the kind of thing that you could do an entire lecture completely on. I think I'm going to be focusing more today on what we know as unconscious bias but conscious bias is 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 flat out discrimination intentional discrimination got you know the kind of things that lawsuits are filed for and won um uh, uh the uh someone that intentionally wants to screen out or use technology to eliminate certain types of race or age or color or um, uh, uh, religion um, by looking at keywords or phrases or that sort of thing and using those things to retaliate or to blackmail or to um, uh, fire them from a job. That, those are different sort of biases. And, and those are not to say easy to spot because obviously there are lawsuits Worth millions of dollars, you know, filed every year based on conscious and unconscious bias. Um, but it's it's not as hard to deal with as unconscious bias, which I think is the more prevalent problem with things like artificial intelligence. I don't think the programmers who set up certain sort of art, artificial intelligence systems intended for the screening they and we'll talk about it soon about how certain companies set up artificial intelligence systems and they screened out people of color at times or people who were of uh, women were targeted were taken out of the system and and disqualified um, and it wasn't the programmer's intention to, to screen out those people or to have the program work that way, but it's just the way that it worked out based on the unconscious biases placed into the program by the programmer who didn't really intend that to happen, but that's how it turned out. Um, but we do have a lot of unconscious bias. Um, with social stereotypes, um, uh, people that, with, that are individuals from outside their own conscious awareness. Um, people hold unconscious beliefs about various social and identity groups. And these biases stem from one's tendency to organize social words by categorize. Um, it's hard to be able to avoid this sort of prejudice because it's something that comes from how you grow up and your experiences and the things that people say and 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 
speak about around you, levels of education, levels of, of personal experience just getting out more uh, people that that you know are very insular and don't aren't very social may have different biases because they don't really get to know other people of different races colors religions and so forth to see that there's you know people people are are different based on all those things but they're also the same in a lot of ways and if you seek that commonality between people and make that something that you use to build a relationship with them, then you don't have those biases. Those biases go away. But if you don't ever get to know people of any other type other than, you know, basically, quote unquote, who you are, and you don't get that experience of of seeing the world for what it is and understanding there's people, you know, uh, 10,000 miles away who are living with the problems of day to day, you know, existence, the way that you do and the way that, that people, um, next door are feeling, then if you can't empathize with that, then those biases will take over. And, um, it's easy for people to find reasons to hate and a lot more work to find reasons to give people a chance and to get to know them. I mean, it just, to get to know somebody else takes effort and to blindly hate someone takes no effort at all other than just giving into the hatred that you may already have built in on. I'm not saying you as, as an audience, I think that you're all very uh, 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 reasonable people, but I'm talking as a generic sense that, that the persons that feel this sort of hatred have not had that experience in their lives looking at a wider variety, or they've had some incredibly negative experiences and they apply it to everybody else of that particular type. And it's very unfortunate and it leads to cycle that we're never able to break effectively it keeps circling upon itself um the person that is discriminated against then feels if they are discriminated against let's say and i i, I hate to 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 bring this up because it's 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 a personal thing but it's someone that i know very closely that works um in a state office and she feels that there are uh, younger women that don't relate at all to her. She's close to 60. And they're in their 30s or, you know, uh, late 20s. And that they've really socially acted in a way to exclude her from everything. Um, they never, like, ask her out to lunch. They all go as a group leave her alone they don't talk to her in the office they uh, uh, uh have uh really isolated her and she just you know says you know she basically ignores it in the uh, workplace but she really feels that that there's been nothing done to to bridge this age gap and she would like to be friends with them but they already sort of have have a, a, a predisposition to feel like, oh, well, because this lady is 60 years old, she has nothing to offer to them because they're in their 20s and 30s. And, and it just, and so then she feels resentful to these younger ladies. And then it would mean that when a, a new person joins, male or female, if they're younger, she's going to have a bias to think that, well, that person's going to bond with the younger folks and they're going, and often is the case, at least to my friend's perception, that this person would then associate with the um, uh, younger folks and sort of block out my friend again, um, who would, you know, have to work extra hard to try to 
convert this person over and and make them want to be friendly to her because they will already quote unquote poison any new person that comes in that's younger about oh well she's old and she's grumpy and you know we you know we have nothing in common with her and why you know we we just ignore her and and if you want to be cool you'll ignore her too it's 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 i know it sounds juvenile in that sense but i think i can bring up i i'm sure that you folks have some situation if you look at where you maybe yourself or you've known someone who's gone through something like that where that there's that office um uh isolation and that sort of ostracization that goes on either with a conscious or unconscious bias with someone but based on their their age or or how they don't fit in with a particular group at work. Um, so here's what we know from a UCSF study and that is um, biases emerge during middle childhood and appear to develop across childhood unconscious biases have real world effect on behavior and that unconscious biases are are malleable and that that people if they're made aware of these unconscious biases and they realize that it really is an unjust situation and perpetuates as i said a cycle of people mistrusting others and 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 a one person that is biased against is going to be biased against the people that are showing the bias against them as a group. And that just winds up, again, creating bias everywhere you look. But if everyone was made aware of it, perhaps then there's the ability to work backwards from it and eliminate it because people say, okay, this is behavior. It's got to stop. Everyone can get along with each other. It doesn't matter. How old you are with somebody? If you you want you know I I if you want to have lunch with somebody or or you know share some donuts or something like that, it's everyone should be involved and not feel like they're excluded just because of something that they can't control. Um, a substantial amount of research has been published showing that unconscious bias in various areas, including the criminal justice system, education, and healthcare. And as we see, bias can have um, uh, a uh, impact on hiring and mentoring. And in the case of UCSF, they could say healthcare disparities. And I think that that, that is actually a significant issue, um, as we've seen. You know, and again, not I'm not trying to make this political, but we've seen that that um, in the COVID virus epidemic that is currently we're currently under right now in 2020 um uh, we're seeing that different levels of care and and um, different levels of um, infection rates are going on in the minority communities um and people of of different um uh, uh, racial backgrounds are uh uh, showing different levels of healthcare access and um, the care that they're receiving, and just even the infection rates that are going on uh, based on racial uh, uh, classifications. And that is a real big tragedy. It's, it's bad enough when it means broken hearts of the workplace kind of thing. It's that's that's bad. It's worse when it means it's a hiring thing um, and that people are, are, are losing their jobs and not being able to advance or uh, be able to reach their fullest potential at work based on these biases. Um, but it's way worse when we think about the levels of health care being provided to individuals during this crisis and that someone wouldn't be getting the uh, highest level of care due to them based on something, again, that they're not able to change and from a perception that was based either consciously or unconsciously against them. 
uh, due to a bias. So let's talk about the, uh, the very complicated issue of artificial intelligence and its role in determining bias. And um, artificial intelligence, as, as I talked about earlier, is involved in so many decisions. It, 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 just talking about, you know, voicemail and check recognition is just scratching the tiny surface. A lot of artificial intelligence that's being utilized is in places that you have no idea where it is. It's, it's deeply embedded in computers and, and, and in programming systems throughout all sorts of uh, every industry you can think of. And sometimes it's very subtle, you know, um, and, and just done in a way to um, uh, help people uh, minimize minute tasks and and things that they would just not have you know not have to like want to keep track of um um you know uh artificial intelligence um uh goes all the way through though to the industrialized process and certainly we're seeing it being used more and more in a hr and personnel related level In other words, um, artificial intelligence as a hiring tool and a way to deal with being able to handle Matt, you know, if a job goes out sometimes now and it goes on the web, they can have a thousand applicants go to a particular, you know, uh, uh, position. Um, sometimes even more than that, and that there's just the human effort that it would take to go through each one of those thousand resumes. Obviously, in the old days, when you did have to read these things, and it, let's say it takes you know five minutes a resume, you know, but if you get a thousand of them, you know, five thousand minutes, you do the math. I mean, that's hours and hours of, of work. So. The uh, AI was constructed to go through and screen out resumes to find the ones that they're really, really looking for and narrow it down to, say, 10, 20, or even 100, but 100 having to go over, you know, with your reading through your eyes for five minutes is still a lot of time. So a lot of times they'll maybe reduce it down to 10 um, uh, uh, resumes that they can choose from and then start working on that position right there. But um, so we see that, that AI can do good things, like it can find out, uh, it can go through resumes, it can uh, filter out gender-based wording on job descriptions and provide and performance feedback so it can, it can identify when things are are uh, 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 biased and possibly violating any kind of laws, and, and it can have managers reassess their language and say, hmm, "Okay, so if this is a you know really gender heavy language description, um, and we're we're going to talk about how that really does affect um, jobs and and uh, uh, how." how women apply for jobs and, and, and how it filters out women from applying for jobs. Um, and then anonymous recruitment processes encourage uh, recruiters to focus on skills rather than candidates' first or last name. So, so uh, uh, if somebody's first or last name is, you know, seems like it's not from the United States, or it's, you know, perhaps uh, 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 something that is, quote unquote, too exotic, you know, that's always something that can lead towards discrimination. But, but you would have the an, a, an anonymous recruitment process put in place that just says, we're looking for these skills. It doesn't matter 
you know, what color you are or what, you know, age you are or whatever. We need these skills. We need these, this level of experience. We need this, you know, these particular um, techniques or programs or, or applications that you work with. And, you know, if you can do those things, that's what, that's how we screen you. Not, you know, looking at, at, at you know, oh, well, this person's first name, last name is Smith and this person's last name is Sanchez. Well, we're gonna hire the Smith over Sanchez because we, we believe Smith is, is going to be, you know, white and, and Mr. Sanchez may not be. And so, you know, that obviously isn't, is just an example of it, but that's, that's why they look at having these being uh, anonymous uh, recruitment processes. And then tools that compare employees, um, uh, uh, personal uh, information, uh, they can alert managers when someone is con consistently assigned fewer or less important tasks because of unconscious bias. So they can see if people are not being assigned a task or not being considered for advancement or, or give certain key elements towards an employee's um, uh, uh, status and flag, you know, alert managers that haven't really, especially in large companies, um, law offices, that haven't really been checking to see, okay, this person should be up for advancement now. This person should at least be considered for raise right now. Um, has this person been just assigned lower level tasks for five years and never been given any sort of advancement, you know, no sense of, of, of moving upwards, you know, A, it's, it, 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 you know, should send up flags anyway, and B, should make the firm aware that it's not it's, if it's happening with one person should they look across and see are there others that are also not advancing and getting better skill tasks assigned to them based on something that you can see a common thread with so it can give you information on those trends so there are ways that artificial intelligence can do a really good job of preventing bias by using the power of the computer to look at trends, look at data, look at things that are going on, seeing, identifying them and alerting people that want to eliminate it, how they should look at that and say, okay, we should do something about it. And one thing that, that is, important to understand, and I think anyone who's used, you know, voicemail or, or you know, use one of the, uh, you know, uh, automated voice services for like Comcast or something like that, understands that those things can, can mess up. And um, when you have them messing up, uh, and you have someone holding too religiously to them, in other words, you have somebody basically, you know, who feels that, that, that AI is perfect and that it can never make a mistake and they don't investigate these things. They don't spend the time to really understand that this is something that's giving you an indicator. It's giving you trends. It's giving you suggestions to investigate, but it's not saying necessarily that this is discriminating this is discrimination this is discriminatory that is always going to be a perceptive thing that a computer is never going to be able to really understand and i mean computers don't have emotions we know that and so the computer can only really understand what the level of identification is and the parameters that are programmed into it. <clears throat> and if that's faulty, or if that is, there's gonna be the internal biases of the 
programmer that creates this program, the artificial intelligence program, that's going to change the level of, of bias inherent in the program as well. And so that's where we get into the concept of artificial intelligence creating bias. And what I'm saying is that it doesn't, artificial intelligence itself doesn't create bias, but it can create either the appearance of bias or have the results be biased because of, I guess the, maybe the, 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 the best way of describing the effect is, is the Sorcerer's Apprentice, where you have a, a, a programming glitch that gets out of control, something they didn't intend for it to do, and it just keeps multiplying over itself until it gets so out of control that it, it's, it's the, the creator itself doesn't understand what it's doing, and it's, it's, it's on its own, and it's, you know, wrecking the whole palace with, with uh, pouring water till, till everything floods. Um, uh, uh, so we've seen, there have been a number of stories about voice recognition and facial recognition uh, creating a, a bias against people of darker skin color. Um, and uh, uh, people who have heavier accents and people who have, um, and even women have, with higher voices or, 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 or voices that are less powerful um, can be biased against when it comes to voice recognition. And again, with facial recognition too. And there was a situation where um, a, a police, uh, agency was trying to use facial recognition and was it was just recognizing African Americans but not it was it was not working with 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 uh, it was false positive too many African Americans and they had to eliminate it. Um, uh, and then Amazon created a, a tool that filtered out women and basically eliminated women who were applying for positions at amazon.com and it was not something that was done on purpose but they were it was the way that it was coded they were trying to 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 highlight it out and it then put it into a position where it was then being negatively screened instead of just being categorized in a day in they were just trying to indicate, okay, these are things, this, you know, indicates this is a woman that, that, that is applying. But instead, it made it so that it was like a negative against the uh, uh, women who are applying and screen them out. And it wasn't done with the intention to do that, but it was still, there wasn't really a good justification for why they were going through their artificial intelligence, looking for women and women's studies and women's soccer and trying to, to isolate that out and make that something that was separately categorized. And so uh, uh, Amazon had to change that um, uh, tool. Uh, uh, and, and you can probably be pretty rest assured that it was a man who programmed that in. Um, and so it wasn't the technology that said it wanted to go and screen women out. It was something that was done by the program. So again, these AI doesn't do stuff on its own. It still has to do something that was, it was at some time programmed to do. And when somebody makes a mistake or, or does something on purpose to uh, tweak the AI or to AI is just so powerful. It just allows you to do anything you really want to with the data that's within your control. So if you want it to find women's issues and screen them off and, 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 you know, delete them from the system, it allows you to do that. So it's men, designed to filter filter these things out not the, the technology it's it, it's or it's whatever the person decides it needs to ai needs to do 
AI has the power to do if it's done correctly. And if it's done for evil purposes or for, for purposes that aren't legal, it still has the power to do that. Just like, you know, you can use a gun for hunting or you can use a gun to rob a bank. It's tools have always been there to do the bidding of the person that designed them and the person that it handles them. And if it's, if it's going to be something, AI has so much power to do those things, they can make those sort of biases very easy to, to take action on and to, to empower them as much as it does to allow you to eliminate them, identify them and eliminate them. And then we've seen in a lot of times where the AI is being used to narrow the focus of development um, so that they get too small of a group involved and, and that they don't really understand how the differences between different features, physical features, can equal different results in, in the way people's voices sound or in you know, the color of their skin or, or their, uh, 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 the way that they move personally, you know, um, in, in, or the, how fast they can type on a keyboard or uh, 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 how easily they can use a mouse or uh, especially things that have certain timing built into them um, so that they're saying, well, if you don't respond back within a certain amount of time. And remember, one thing too, that I think some people sort of forget about is that everything on the computer the computer is aware of for every millisecond micro millisecond that the computer is around it knows if you're touching the keyboard and a key it knows if you're moving the mouse it knows you know if you're not doing anything um especially in this era of of alexa and uh with siri and with you know voice recognition on your phone and cortana um, people have stuff that's listening to them all the time, waiting for input. And that's another level of where AI has really, you know, forced itself into modern day life is that you have electronic devices listening to you all the time, trying to interpret what you're saying, waiting for their name to be brought up. And then they are going to start looking things up for you, trying to find things for you turning things on and off, all of that sort of stuff, which is something humans want, but it's also something that carries with it the inherent dangers of bias and, and, and obviously discrimination. So now let's um, talk more about how technology is being used to fight bias. For instance, one way is to uh, use technology as a as a platform to um, anonymize applications we talked about. Um, uh, they did say that, that uh, names were less likely to affect results when uh, uh, an anonymizing system was put into place. And it makes it easier for managers to just focus on skills and experience. And then predictive analysis, like we talked about, is allowing um, uh, to see uh, things, analyzing uh, employee performance reviews, uh, uh, seeing what skills are being used effectively um, and using these sort of things as the basis of how managers would promote and, 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 and or fire different people based on those things and measurable statistics than it is to say, well, I just didn't like him because, you know, he's lazy, you know, fill in the blank, you know. So that's the, the you can, if you're going to look toward, towards, from, and that you don't leave it just to be one racial group getting all the promotions or getting all the, the, the better jobs or better positions. Um, and then there's the uh, AI-based interviewing. So being able to use 
artificial intelligence in the way of a chatbot, which I think a lot of people have used before. It's not wonderful, but it, sometimes you can really at least get most of the questions that you would ask in an interview answered, or you as the person interviewing can at least submit to the company the answers they want most of all if they had somebody interviewing. And that at least gets you into another level so that you can then set yourself up for either, you know, uh, a Zoom interview like we're doing these days or, you know, when we get over the coronavirus problems, hopefully we'll be doing some more in-person interviews again. And people are willing to see each other in, in, in person and hang out that way. So I think right now, especially with how we are with um, uh, COVID-19, AI-based interviewing and doing things through the computer are going to be way more uh, prevalent than, uh, than we've seen before. So that, it's just going to be probably more likely going to be the case than less likely as time moves on. And then finally, smarter assessments. So you can use these uh, things, you combine artificial intelligence to improve the results and eliminate bias. And Smart assessments focus on what candidates do the best. They can help collect the data that you need, spot patterns for the top performers, and use those things to use, okay, who else do we want to hire in our, our office that meets those same qualifications? So it, as a tool, it can, AI can do a lot of things and shortcut things to make what goes on in the hiring and and uh, promotional levels easier if it's done in a correct way and with the conscious effort to eliminate bias in the process using these different tools. Um, so then there's also, I'd like to discuss sort of the, the bias for not using technology. That, that is how some people are, are being biased against because their level of technology isn't as as proficient or is perceived to be not as proficient as um, uh, those that are say of levels that are then of people that are not in that classification would then bias against that classification using technology and their lack of access to that technology as part of where that bias stems from. So we have the areas of age, sexual, economic, and cultural bias. And we'll discuss these. Um, so technology and age bias. And you do see this in the, the workforce. It's, yes, computers are probably only when you really stand back and look at it, you know, in the office, 30 years is probably about as long as most offices have had a computer. And really, a lot of offices didn't have computers as prevalent until the early 2000s. So we we'll may, may be talking about 20 years of, of widespread computer use in most offices where, where individuals were given their own machines instead of there being maybe one or two machines in the entire office. and People had to share it, or it was just the the you know accountant computer, and that was, and then maybe the the head attorney or or the, the boss of the, the uh, place had a computer, and then nobody, everyone else still had typewriters or, or something like that. But it didn't really start happening until you know the mid '90s, and then maybe the late '90s, you would see uh, a, a computer starting to take place over people's workstations. So it hasn't been that long, but but you have seen several generations of people come into computer use. And as they are, you are seeing that there's a, a greater discrimination against people who are over 50 and certainly over 60 that are trying to uh, work in the modern office. And here's some quotes that, that um, I found from a Forbes article where it said, the rest of our office is young. They just don't fit in with our culture, the first one. Our industry is brand new, said the second. 
Older candidates don't bring any relevant experience, but they come with a higher paycheck. And then I'm not sure if an older employee would be able to adapt and learn quickly in our fast-paced work culture. I nodded in agreement. All these things made sense. Then one of them interjected, I don't want to feel like we have an office mom. So there's sort of this, this built-in age bias that is occurring now, and it's that, that feeling that people who are older cannot learn new technology as fast as someone who's younger. Whether that's true or not, good question. Now, sexual bias. Women are very underrepresented in technology. And in the 70s and the 80s, technology was just known as a man's job. Um, and so we see that in technology, male language is present in a lot of uh, what's written. It, it uses the words he, it uses him, it uses um, a lot of other uh, 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 what they would call you know, more aggressive male language in just how the whole sales process and, and marketing process to, to manuals, technical manuals. There's a lot of that that's present in the way that it's written because let's face it, 70s and 80s technical manuals were mostly written by men. So, um, and it's, you would say, well, that, shouldn't matter it's technical it, it, what's what's the difference but there's a lot of things to explain how something works to somebody isn't all i've spent a lifetime teaching technology to people as a professor at, uh, cal state hayward and uh, san francisco state um, and i taught computer applications to paralegals and i can tell you there's a huge there's a different approach in how women perceive technology, especially in the early 2000s, versus how men perceive it. I think that that is, is beginning to, to move forward, but unfortunately, we get some, some bad news just down below. But, but um, uh, 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 we've seen now that in, According to the National Center of Education Statistics, 28% of women of bachelor's degrees in computer and information society, science went to women in the year 2000. But in 2016, it was 18%. So we saw a 10% drop in women getting bachelor degrees in computer and information science. And if you don't have women going, getting bachelor degrees, I can tell you they're not getting their master's at a higher percentage. So so you're not even seeing women go through the bachelor's area in computers. Now, computers are, are being used by women more, but they're not being made and engineered by women more, which means that men are still controlling how the computer looks, how it's designed, how it feels, the programming that goes into it, the way people read, what's on the screen, the font, it's a lot. It's, it's a lot, people's perceptions are very different on a lot of different things. And, and men versus women can't give a full discussion on that, but it is something that, it, it, it's, not one, it's not one particular thing, but when you talk about the bias already inherent in the industry, the fact that you then have everything made by men it has male language built into it and male appeals to men because it was made by men and without any kind of input from women in the most part. That just further creates a barrier and a bias towards women wanting to be part of that field. And that's why we see the numbers dropping so dramatically. Um, and then pregnancy and motherhood is always going to be an issue that comes up and, and certainly something that, that can lead towards a bias situation. And then you add in age and race also being a factor against women and and it can be very difficult it really have a lot of things stacked against them all at the same time um uh this just shows that that uh as an example these walmart posts were showing uh, uh job posts were showing that they were mostly 
Mel, I mean, you, you, the, uh, this program called Textio goes and looks through language and finds out what's neutral language, masculine language, or feminine. Notice there's a little bit of slightly feminine language. And everything skews much heavier towards masculine, some masculine, and slightly masculine. Of course, neutral is the most, but you don't see a whole lot of uh, feminine or or even somewhat feminine language involved in these Walmart uh, job posts. Um, then you have uh, uh, this is a uh, gender career task um, survey that was done, and it was showing that that again female input and female that that, that, that uh, men men were were uh, automatically associated men with careers and females with family. Um, the strongest and moderate levels were very strong and even slightly automatic association with male with career and female with family was much higher than little or no versus slight automatic association with male and female and moderate association. So the little or no automatic preference between gender and family or career is only 17% versus um, uh, a vast majority of uh, showing either strong or moderate association. So um, it, it, it's, it's sad that that's where we're at and it's something that requires more conscious uh, attempts by the industry, you know, the technology industry in particular, to reverse that and to make, uh, if it is unconscious by the uh, uh, computer industry that is doing this, it needs to find a way to get around it so that there is a level of, of fairness. And at least, uh, it's, and, and for those that may be saying, well, we shouldn't make it 32%, you know, on the other side, I don't agree either. I think, I don't see why the 17% couldn't be, you know, 90% and, and have there not be a, a situation where men are only associated with careers and women are only associated with family or so strongly associated with those two, um, uh, dichotomies um, and then there's this this survey where why uh, women didn't apply for a particular job and they didn't think that it was worth uh, they 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 would meet the qualifications they would didn't want to waste their time and energy um, but there were 13 percent of women were saying that they already made clear who they were looking for. And then uh, the 21% figure showing that women just didn't want to put themselves out because they thought it was so likely they would fail. And that was, you know, that's actually a pretty sad, sad number as well. Um, then we have the uh, economic bias that comes from uh, technology. And that is computers and technology do cost money. And people in rural access areas don't have the same access as city access. And so high-speed internet is not available everywhere. And uh, better computers equal better connections, better advancement in technology. So basically, you know, we've seen in the COVID virus situation that there are children that are expected to do distance learning when they have no internet access and no ability to uh, or their computers are so old and slow at home or they don't have computers at home or even cell phones they're not able to participate with distance learning or they're in areas that don't have dsl don't have high speed access don't have um, cellular service <clears throat> <clears throat> and it's making it very difficult for them um, that can lead obviously to fewer opportunities and a way to somebody's for somebody to say, you know, we're not going to hire you, or we're 
we're not going to give you an opportunity because you don't have access to the internet or you don't have access to a better computer. So we talked about with cultural bias, there's uh, facial recognition was, was a problem for uh, certain artificial intelligence units. Um, accent and, and dialect recognition could be a big problem. And, and <clears throat> we saw in 2015 in a survey, according to the National Science Board, only 2.5% of Google's workforce is black, while Facebook and Microsoft are at 4%. And little data exists on the number of trans workers or other gender minorities in the AI field. So I doubt it's it's any higher than these two numbers. So thinking about, you know, 2.5% of Google's workforce being African American and 4% at Facebook and Microsoft. Those are some of the biggest companies we have. And unfortunately, we're just not seeing anything close to what you would have as ethnic diversity in a lot of situations. So what solutions are there? Um, and again, I'd like to be able to say that there was just a, a, a computer program that could fix this all, or that I could just wave a magic wand and we'd all get along, but there isn't. So um, take this with the train of philosophy that requires to put your mind around what it takes to eliminate unconscious bias. Um, because that's probably the thing that matters most in something that we can control and that there's something that we can do to eliminate. So understanding that unconscious bias is normal is probably the first thing that is important for us to be able to understand and do something about. Um, and then uh, it doesn't make you bad just because you have an unconscious bias. There's so much that goes into what makes bias, unconscious bias happen. But knowing that it's something that can be corrected and not just accepting it or worse off, you know, taking advantage of it. Um, bias is something that if it is reduced, and if the things that are controlled, controllable, are controlled, the cycle of what perpetuates unconscious bias goes down. And people don't feel biased against, then they aren't going to perpetuate it against other people, likely. It's not, there isn't anything to prove that, but that's just the way that, you know, you can hope and, and studies show that is what winds up happening when bias is reduced you have <clears throat> less perpetuation of it um, as time moves forward and then you have to identify the biases in the the impact <clears throat> on the um, workplace there are uh, tests that you can use to find where the biases are you can incorporate artificial intelligence to look for biases and be able to notice trends and eliminate language problems and be able to suggest neutral language so that um, it's, it's pointed towards all employees, not just men. Um, and, and, you know, also open up the, uh, the channels for anonymous discourse and input by employees, by people in the workplace, so that they can um, air the uh, grievances that they have or the feelings that they have of bias without feeling that they could be, um, have retribution brought against them. And then um, the hardest thing, and this is probably number three, is easier said than done, but broaden your viewpoint and educate others. When you see a negative bias, then, and you have to understand how and why it makes you uncomfortable. Then you, when you're making critical decisions, you can invite other people of other viewpoints to give you input. And if you see somebody with potential bias, trying to point it out to them to see if maybe truly it's just unconscious to them um, and that it's something that they want to correct. And then, if people can understand that 
the biases, the unconscious biases are being brought forward by a lack of understanding, yet there are moves being done to correct it, um, both with technology and internally as, as a human thing, then people can work together to eliminate their own biases too. If people see one person building a bridge halfway across, if, they're, if they understand how important it is to them, they'll build the bridge the other half of the way and you guys can meet, everyone can meet in the middle. And that's how this would work in an ideal world. Can I create an ideal world simply by having this MCLE session? I don't think so, but I think these were important things to talk about and important things for you to think about as you go forward in the legal world. There's no conclusion, there's no quick fix. Tech problem is a human problem. Attitudes change as technology changes. And the awareness to check these things, to check these systems, fixing something versus, versus it telling us what we want to hear. That is a really important element um, to it. And then balancing ethical diversity versus employing search and job requirements are are always going to be in the background. Um, understanding that, that as our attitudes change towards this, the technology will change. And we do have the ability to, to alter these systems. We're not stuck with anything the way it is. The only thing that we're stuck with is our own perceptions and our own biases, and maybe our inability to recognize those things and an inability to work on those things. Once we decide that it's time to work on those things and to make those things better, then we're going to see that technology can be there for us to fix this, these sort of problems and to help us build a better workplace, build a better world for all of us. Thank you very much.